name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. When my father joined, my grandfather rather, uh, joined the army in 1890, the older officers would have regaled him with stories about the Crimean War. And no doubt the brigadiers and colonels over egged their tales of heroism on the battlefield. But grandfather would already have known a great deal about the Crimean War because it was the first war in history to have a newspaper reporter on the scene, William Howard Russell, whose eyewitness accounts appeared in the Times. Through these accounts, grandfather will have learnt that far more soldiers died of disease, cholera, typhoid, and dysentery, than died in battle. In fact, the ratio was one to five. For every one man that died fighting, five died of disease. And it's this, of course, that prompted Florence Nightingale to go there, and she transformed the practice of nursing. There is a rather dreadful sequel to this. When a soldier died in combat, his widow received a pension, albeit quite modest. But the widow of a soldier who died of disease received nothing. And this injustice continued right up into the First World War. But happily, the people who created war memorials across the land after that war saw things differently and included the names of service people who had died of disease. We are now engaged in another war where disease is central. But this time, Disease is not a byproduct of combat. Disease in the form of COVID-19 is the enemy itself. Like all wars, this war is generating an ever-lengthening casualty list of people who have either died of the disease or whose long-term health appears to have been marred by it, the so-called long COVID. And of course, it's producing an ever-lengthening list of heroes and heroines most notably the nurses and other hospital staff who tend the sick and therefore risk becoming casualties themselves, but also all the other key workers. So how should we honor these heroes and heroines? Normally, in remembrance, in this remembrance season, we honor those who have fought and died for our country by recommitting ourselves to the values that they exemplified and for which they made the supreme sacrifice. In the same way, we should honor our present heroes and heroines by committing ourselves anew to the values that they exemplify and which they, for which they are making such sacrifices. And I should like to suggest three such values. The first is human solidarity. Now, I'm not a great fan of the NHS as an organization. It's hugely bureaucratic and overmanaged. But the moral value it represents is timeless and priceless. That in sickness, we are all equal and we all deserve the same treatment. The frontline hospital workers are taking great risks to make that truth a reality. So let us commit ourselves anew to this value. That in sickness, the grandest billionaire and the humblest tramp are as one. And this in turn means that in every respect of human life, we should treat everyone with the same respect and courtesy. The second value I suggest is duty. The other day I was talking about to a person called Denise, who is suffering long COVID. She's a nurse who works for the Luton and Dunstable Hospital. In the spring, her ward was full of people with COVID, and in April she herself went down with it. Now, several months later, She's breathless, her lungs often hurt, she has almost no energy, and she frequently breaks down weeping. But here's the wonderful thing. She never questions what happened. She never asks, why me? Why did I ever become a nurse? On the contrary, she's grateful that she had the opportunity to do her duty. And what's more, she wants to continue doing her duty. So she's coming back to work three or four days a week, albeit doing quite light tasks. So we can honor people like that by doing our duty, doing what we know in our hearts to be right, without question. All of us, of course, have our specific duties. So we honor Denise and her like by doing those duties without questioning and quibbling. But there is one duty related to the pandemic that I think all of us in our bus pass years 
uh, should have. During this pandemic, the various restrictions have been mainly imposed to protect older people like me. But the cost of these restrictions are mainly borne by the young, in the form of lives and education disrupted, jobs destroyed, and vast national borrowing to be repaid. So my generation, the old generation, owes a huge debt to repay, part of that huge support to repay it to young people. And one way that we can do that is by supporting any policy that helps the young, even at our expense. The third value I want to suggest is best described by the word grit. My daughter-in-law works in Addenbrooke's amongst elderly patients, some of whom have COVID. So she faces real danger every day, and I don't doubt she feels fear. Yet I'm continually amazed at her insistence on maintaining normal family life and in keeping in touch with friends as much as the law allows. That takes real grit, and she tells me that her colleagues are just the same. So how can we honour their grit by showing more grit in our own lives? By grit, I mean getting on with life without grumbling and complaining. So whenever we feel a grumble or a moan rising to our lips, we should swallow it. Tennyson's great poem about the Crimean War contains these famous lines. Theirs is not to make reply, theirs is not to reason why, theirs is but to do and die. Now these may seem rather overdramatic quotations, we're not part of a light brigade charging cannons. But it expresses rather wonderfully the virtues that our COVID heroes and heroines display and which we should honour and emulate. Theirs is not to make reply. That's what we mean by grit, just getting on with life, whatever the difficulties. Theirs is not to reason why. That means doing what we mean by duty, doing what we know in our hearts to be right, without asking too many questions. Theirs is but to do and die. That's what we mean by human solidarity, loving others in this world, that we may die in the eternal love of God.